There's a lot of pages in Scripture, quite a few of them. It takes approximately a year to read through it if you're doing it at a good pace. Nick's done it several times and he says he can get through it in about a year. He's quicker than I am. Especially when you get wound up in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that's a snooze fest. Uh, with all those, uh, those nitty gritty bitty parts of the law that are just, wow, I can't imagine how those fit into my life. However, there's lots of scripture. For sure. But, if the only scripture that we ever encountered or were given was the 25th chapter of Matthew, if we read and hang on every word in the 25th chapter of Matthew, I promise you we would have heaven. I promise you heaven would be ours, and here's why. What's going on in that chapter? Christ is telling three parables. We only read one of them today. But he's telling the parables of the, the virgins who weren't prepared with, the, with their lamps and wicks. And when the bridegroom came, they were not ready. And the ones that were ready went in with the bridegroom and everybody else was sealed outside of the, of the, uh, the palace. And he says, depart from me, I do not know you. The second parable is the man who goes off to a far country and leaves his servants in charge of his worldly goods, his estates. He gives this many talents to one and maybe a few fewer talents to the other and to this other fellow who never showed a lot of initiative, he gave one. He gave everybody a deposit. And when he came back, he asked for an accounting of what they had done with his funds. One had doubled it, one had tripled it. One had done absolutely nothing, the one with the one talent. And he calls him wicked. At least, the very least you could have done was deposit it. And I could have gotten back twice of it, twi some part of it, in, in, uh, in, through usury, through, through, through interest. Depart from me, I don't know you. And then, of course, we have the part of the Gospel lesson which was proclaimed today by Father Deacon Michael, which is an image of, of the judgment of man. Christ offers an image of separating the sheep from the goats, the goats on his left, the sheep on his right, and he lays out for them, for the listener, for you and me, he lays out, blessed are you because you fed me when I was hungry, and you gave me water when I was thirsty, visited me in prison, clothed me when I was naked, etc., etc., etc. Jeez, Lord, when would we do that? Well, whenever you did it to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. And you, on the left, you goats, depart from me, because when I was hungry, you fed me nothing. When I was lonely or in prison, you did not visit me. When I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. When did we see you like that, Lord? Whenever you ignored the need and saw anybody and turned your back, you turned your back on me. Now depart into eternity away from me. That's a scary thought. <coughs> you see, the 25th chapter of Matthew is the scripture, that one scripture, if you have one thing to hang on, it's the scripture that brings order to chaos. What did we have before the Lord began to speak? Before he spoke everything into existence? There was, in Hebrew, it's tohu avohu. There was chaos over the face of the deep. And as the Lord spoke more and more, he would bring order to the chaos. And he would establish a firmament to keep the water above from the water below. And he would bring forth land, and he would bring forth <coughs> man and animals and all, all manner of plant and swimming fish and uh, land-dwelling animal and on the very last thing he, he made man because he had made everything in preparation for man. He spoke this order into existence, this perfect order. That was his word, that was Christ. This gospel lesson, this whole chapter of Matthew, is 
in a way, a repetition of that. Because, listen, we dwell in chaos. You and I. We thankfully have a life in the church. We thankfully have the lectionary calendar, the readings of the scriptures set up for every day. We have the liturgical schedule. We have the liturgical calendar to cleave to the body of Christ to find ourselves in. But we dwell in chaos. As soon as we leave these doors, we walk out into chaos. And it is only the word of God that brings order to that chaos. This is a gospel lesson. The first two are about love of God. The third one is about love of our neighbor, which you might be surprised to understand aren't separated. They're not different. We love God by loving our neighbor. He tells us that in the third parable in Matthew 25. In case we were under some other conviction or some confusion, this is what brings order to the chaos. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. Isn't that Matthew 25? It's told in a different way, summed up. And Christ says in the Gospels, on this hang all, hangs all the law and the prophets. To love the Lord your God above all things and your neighbor as yourself. Which is to say to do the same thing. Isn't this a different, succinct way of retelling Matthew 25? We gain heaven through humility. And we gain perdition, damnation, through pridefulness. The Lord, when he's describing the second scenario to them who are considered goats, he's describing pridefulness. He's describing self-worship. He's describing closed-mindedness and hard-heartedness. And to the sheep, he is describing humility. Whenever you laid down yourself for someone else, you did it for me, and you are welcomed into the kingdom that I prepared for you. Order to chaos. You see, we exist in chaos. We exist in disorder. Apart from the liturgical celebrations of the services and our, perhaps our prayer life, we walk out into the world and become confused and mixed up. And many things draw upon our heart. Many things call to our consciousness. Many suggestions are laid before us by the evil one for us to be attracted to. That will excite our hungers, our basest hungers. But my friends, this starts at the stomach. Uh oh, he's going to talk about fasting. <laughs> You're right, I am. <laughs> This is the Sunday of meat fair, in case you weren't aware. Because uh, before yesterday, I was like, I think that's in two weeks. And Father Deacon corrected me last night and said, nope, that's tomorrow. <laughs> Whoops. I mean, I knew it was coming up. I just didn't have that consciousness that it was upon us already. I knew it, but up here, but my whole body hadn't, hadn't received the message that today is meat fair. Today is the day we stop with the flesh meats. And next week we'll stop with the curdled milk. That's a the wonderful way the prayer when we bless it at Pascha, we bless the flesh meats and curdled milk, the cheese. <laughs> Doesn't sound so appetizing at that point. We start with meat fair today. And as I and many of you and us often come to, we think, oh, we just got through with a Lent. We just got through with winter Lent. I'm tired of fasting. We've been We've been feasting a little bit. We enjoyed our, our, our winter holidays. And my goodness, we've been thrust back into a, a fasting cycle. And that's sometimes, if we've got our mind in the chaos, we sometimes consider that a negative. I have this conversation with people many times recently, and I have for the last 15 or so years. But this is where we enter into fasting. The 
fasting that we do, that the church prescribes for us, the fasting practices during the Great Lent, is another method of bringing order to the chaos. Here's why. Because it all starts at the stomach. Pride begins in the stomach with gluttony. The basis of our desires is to eat and to feed ourselves. It's, it's a, a necessary function like breathing and drinking water, anyway. It starts in the stomach. You and I are called to and, and able to worship with our whole being. Our whole entire physis. Our whole entire nature, body, soul, and spirit. This is the way we worship God. This is the way we pray. This is the way we experience the incarnate word of God, which is Christ. With all of our being. Tell me, then, how it could possibly make sense to only enter into fasting up here. Do you think the body will respond? Do you think the body will reap any benefit of fasting if all we're doing is experiencing the fasting up here? We know why we do it. We can read things about the fast. We can read holy books, we can read scripture more during Lent. By the way, we should. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm actually saying please do it more. But unless we enter into the Lenten experience with our entire being, we're not leaving the chaos behind. Here's what's going on when we're fasting. We take the very root of our sinfulness, which is gluttony. It doesn't always mean with food, but that's the most fundamental part of our gluttony, is what we eat and how much and and, and, and in what amounts, eat and drink and such. If we're taking the stomach, and we're putting that in the proper order that the church gives us, the heart will follow. The mind might even get there eventually too. Although there's all kinds of chaos going on in our mind at any given time. But even the mind will be quieted. If we are entering into the fast with the proper humility and the proper attitude. Oh, I don't want to fast. I don't want to eat. Or I can never find anything to eat when I'm out and everything tastes gross and I hate oatmeal. <laughs> it's true, I do hate oatmeal. Except for oatmeal cookies. I quite like those. That's a hint, by the way. Um, what to bring to the Pasca picnic. Oatmeal cookies <laughs> and beaten flesh meats and curd milk. I'm already, I'm already getting nervous about fasting. If we enter into the fast with the proper humility and the proper attitude, we will reap the benefit of why the fast is given to us. Our mind will eventually join our stomach and our heart in leaving the chaos behind. Our mind will be quiet. Our prayer life will increase. Our joy will be magnified. So that when we get to the Feast of Feasts, when we arrive at Pascha, we will not only proclaim Christ is risen and have that up to late euphoria that Christ is risen, but when we allow our bodies to once again eat the rich foods, the flesh meats and the curdled milk and the oatmeal cookies, <laughs> when we allow our bodies to once again we're not releasing them to the chaos, but we're allowing them to experience joy, to experience something different. We've kept this away from ourselves. For 40, actually, it ends up being roughly 50 days, 40, 47 days, whatever. Because Holy Week is also a fasting week, on top of the 40 days. After that length of time, we have had ourselves, if we're doing it properly, we have had ourselves in a physical situation where we have brought an order that is from the outside, outside of our, our minds, outside of uh, anything that would be natural for us. We have imposed an order, or we have submitted to, through humility, to an order that is given by God to mankind, so that order may be brought to chaos, and our mind and hearts will be in the right place. So that humility is a lot more possible. So that we, in the end of things, may love our neighbor as ourselves. So that we may stand before Christ at his final judgment. The last judgment, we might stand before him and hear good and faithful servant. 
You loved your neighbor like you love yourself. You treated your neighbor as if he was me. You got it. You understand it. And because you understand it, and because you lived it, you now will enter into your reward that has been prepared for you. If we're not here seeking that, what are we doing? You know how they say there's no, there's no uh, handbook for living? Well, yes, there is. It's the scriptures, but specifically Matthew 25. Order to chaos. That's what we seek. Outside of God, the world was just chaos. And then he spoke. And order came to existence. He speaks to us and order comes to our hearts. Let us together enter into this fast so that we will stand together and be welcomed as sheep, good and faithful servants. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord to Jesus Christ. Glory Lord, Lord. Lord.